Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study a proclamation that was made to the world on the family. This is a relief made in 720, about 720 BC, of an Assyrian army that's sieging a walled city. You can see on the ladder, you have uh, military people who are going up, and you have some people on top that are kind of like saying, hey, please spare us. This relief is a little bit more popular. Maybe you've seen this one before. This is, once again, the Assyrian army. They've reached the city wall, and they're attacking a city outside of Jerusalem. A little ways away, it's called Lakesh. This city, as it's attacked, is being attacked. You can see, you can see the little ramp there that's been built. It has a siege engine that they're now using. The Assyrian soldiers are protected within it. If you look really carefully right in front of the siege engine, you'll see them pouring a little some hot tar or some boiling oil that they're trying to pour down and inflict some pain and help with the siege. Other sieges are even more famous than that one. Manasada was sieged by the Roman troops in about 33 or 73 to 74 AD, and the historian Josephus writes about it. The way the uh, Romans chose to siege, siege this was they surrounded all about, and you can still see remains of where they camped all around. And then they just built a ramp. You can see remnants of that ramp right above probably where my head is on the screen. If I rotate by 90 degrees, this is a picture of that big old long ramp going up to Masada. There have been sieges for thousands of years. You know, this is Lisbon, city of Lisbon that was sieged in 1147 AD. Siege warfare has a lot of things in common, whether it was from Assyrians clear up to Lisbon. It starts with a blockade. The opposing army surrounds it and blocks all communication in or out. It blocks any supplies that are coming in that may fortify the people, and it blocks reinforcements that may come to save the day. Siege warfare includes that that outside attacking force surrounds the city. For the most part, a siege just is a constant and low-intensity conflict until maybe the very end. Siege warfare reworks to reduce existing fortifications of the city or wherever it's attacking. And in Wikipedia, it just has this great little phrase on siege warfare. It uses deception or treachery to bypass defenses. There are some people who made a lot of notoriety by building some of those defenses. It's said that Leonardo da Vinci gained as much of his renown from the design of his fortifications as he did from his artwork. Well, in 1998, President Gordon B. Hinckley said, the home is under siege. He said this, Never before, at least not in our generation, have the forces of evil been so blatant, so brazen, so aggressive as they are today. Things we dared not speak about in earlier times are now constantly projected into our living rooms. All sensitivity is cast aside, as reporters and pundits speak with a disgusting plainness of things that can only stir curiosity and lead to evil. The home is under siege. So many families are being destroyed. Sisters, guard your children. They live in a world of evil. The forces are all about them. As we look at this home being under siege, we realize that Satan wants to block communication within a family. He wants to block those spiritual supplies that may come into a family and any reinforcements that would come to strengthen us. He does strive to surround us with evil influences, whether it's media or wherever it is. And it seems to be just constant all around us. Maybe we can tune it out and it's low intensity, but Satan is actively working to reduce existing fortifications in the family, in the home. And like siege warfare, Satan uses deception or treachery to bypass the defenses that may be for families. And just as Leonardo da Vinci was renowned for the design of fortifications, prophets and apostles are known for their work to strengthen the family. 
President Russell M. Nelson gave a little bit of history of how that was the intent of the Quorum of the Twelve and First Presidency that led to the creation of the Proclamation on the Family. President Nelson said this, One day in 1994, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spent a day in their council room in the Salt Lake Temple discussing issues surrounding the family. They considered everything, from the increasingly ubiquitous nature of pornography to potential anti-family legislation of various kinds. This was not a new discussion, but that day the entire agenda revolved around this one vital topic. The Twelve reviewed both doctrine and policies, considering those things that could be changed, that could not be changed, like doctrine, and those things that could possibly be policies. They discussed issues they saw coming, including an intensified societal push for gay marriage and transgender rights. But that was not the end of what we saw, Elder Nelson explained. We could see the efforts of various communities to do away with all standards and limitations on sexual activity. We saw the confusion of genders. We could see it all coming. This extended discussion, along with others over a period of time, led to the conclusion that the Twelve should prepare a document, perhaps even a proclamation, outlining the Church's stand on the family to present to the First Presidency for consideration. And that comes from uh, Sherry Dew's book, Insights from a Prophet's Life, that came out in 2019. And as, so as I read the proclamation again, I just thought, okay, what doctrines are in there that will fortify our homes? I thought maybe that's what I'll focus on. And as I went and start studying and preparing for, for this, I just realized there's so much I could really look at and focus on and tangents I could take. I thought, well, you know what I want to do is ask my students, what's meaningful to you? So I asked all my classes, spend one minute, I put this up on the board, projected it, and then I asked them, would you just come up and underline a phrase or put a star by a sentence that's meaningful to you? And so that's what they did. So I'm going to start going through it. You can kind of see this on the screen, that they put stars and said, okay, this is what is important and meaningful to me. I was a little bit amazed at some of the things that they put lots of stars by. And there are some where I kind of thought, okay, I understand maybe why they didn't. The number one, as you can kind of see, is the second paragraph, the first sentence of the second paragraph of the family proclamation. And number two was down towards the bottom of that first column. Well, let me just hit some of the things that they felt were important to them. The number one thing that my students focused on that was meaningful to them was that all human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. I think in the world today, there's an emphasis that on whatever it is that you ought to be the ideal, this, that, or the other thing. And maybe people who are defined as loyal Christians are seen as maybe the ugly ducklings. And I think maybe that's a great analogy. Maybe sometimes we're seen as an ugly duckling, or we see ourselves as an ugly duckling. But there's divine potential in us. President Uchtdorf used this analogy when he said, There will always be voices telling you that you are foolish to believe that you are swans, insisting you are but ugly ducklings, and that you can't expect to become anything else. But you know better. Because of the revealed word of a merciful God, you have seen your true reflection in the water, and you have felt the eternal glory of that divine spirit within you. You are no ordinary beings, my beloved young friends all around the world. You are glorious and eternal. No matter your circumstances or trials in life, I urge you to remember who you are, where you came from, and where you're going. For the answers to those questions will truly provide confidence and direction for your life. If we only understood who we are and what is in store for us, it would enlighten even the darkest souls. Of course there will always be voices telling you that you are foolish to believe you are swans insisting you're but ugly ducklings, but you know better, you are no ordinary beings. Elder Uchtdorf also said, We are the literal spirit children of divine, immortal, omnipotent, heavenly parents. And I believe that. The second most uh, meaningful, by number of stars or underlines, quote from the family proclamation, 
is that husbands and wife have a solemn responsibility to love and care for each other and for their children. And maybe part of me just said, okay, I get that because you're the children and you realize that parents should be taking care of you. And, and I could kind of see why teenagers would maybe star that. Years ago, a friend suggested that one of the best things I could do for my children was to love my wife. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Another very meaningful sentence for my students was, We, the First Presidency, and Council of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. I have a question box in the back of my classroom. I probably get more questions on this sentence than probably any other topic, at least this year. Our millennials and our Gen Z do still like marriage. They like the idea of marriage. In 2018, the millennials and Gen Z were asked how they felt about marriage. 77%, this is not a church study, but 77% of ages 13 to 35 said they wanted to get married. 80% of those age group, Gen Z and millennials, think they should be financially stable before they get married. So we want to get married, but we're also delaying until we get financially stable. And this is reported just this last month in the Deseret News. Quote, Many young adults see marriage as nice, but not a priority, and view their 20s as a time to focus on education, work, and fun, said Brad Wilcox. He notes that when young adults delay marriage and starting a family, they become less likely to do either. And while marriage and family typically provide some direction and purpose, unmarried men especially are more likely to instead drift, he said, adding that men and women, even in their 20s, are markedly less happy and more likely to fall into substance abuse when they're not married. We realize that there are some people who, real, who want to redefine marriage. As Elder Neil L. Anderson stated, while many governments and well-meaning individuals have redefined marriage, the Lord has not. In the very beginning, God initiated marriage between a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. He des designated the purposes of marriage to go far beyond the personal satisfaction and fulfillment of adults to, more importantly, advancing the ideal setting for children to be born, reared, and nurtured. Families are the treasures of heaven. Another statement that was well-liked by my, my uh, students was this. Each is a beloved spirit, son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. I think youth and adults too, they need to be reminded they have a divine nature. They have a divine destiny. When I was in junior high, one of the few things I kept for my junior high years was a handout I received in devotional in seminary. This was the handout. I know I'm somebody, because God don't make no junk. junk. Or as Ethel Waters said, I am somebody, because God don't make no junk. One of the focuses of the family proclamation is just to testify the family is ordained of God. And I, I love the way, I just love this quote, okay? Antichrist is anti-family. Any doctrine or principle, our youth hear from the world that is anti-family is also anti-Christ. It's that clear. If our youth cease to believe in the righteous traditions of their fathers, as did the people described in Mosiah 26, if our youth don't understand their part in the plan, they could be led astray. It is the ultimate purpose of the adversary, Elder Packer said, who has great wrath because he knows that he hath but a short time, is to disrupt, disturb, and destroy the home and the family. That is quite a bit of a warning, and, and that is part of the family proclamation. My students also had quite a few stars next to the sentence, we warn the individuals who violate covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring, who fail to fulfill family responsibilities, will one day stand accountable before God. After class, 
in almost every class, I had a student who would stop by and just want me to know that there was one thing in there in particular they felt was very important. Maybe very important, and they said, you're going to talk about this in class, right? I said, yeah. I had a few others that were very sensitive to maybe some of their friends or family members. Maybe those that are making a little bit different uh, choices or challenges in the families. Maybe some difficulties. And they talked about the need for sensitivity. The church issued a statement that kind of reflects some of that sensitivity. This is just this last general conference. They said this, quote, single members of the church, whether divorced, widowed, or never married, make up more than half the adult membership of the church. I think we need to remember things like this statement as we teach family proclamation, realizing that there are some who would like to be in the ideal family and they're not, for whatever reason. And I just, the way, just we need to call upon our members who are single to serve, lift, and teach. Disregard old notions and ideas that have sometimes unintentionally contributed to their feelings of loneliness, that they do not belong or cannot serve. So I, I guess I'm just saying, as we teach maybe what's ideal, we need to be sensitive around us that there are people who long for the ideal, who long to be married, or they long to have a family that is like that in the family proclamation. And we can be sensitive and just teach it in a way that uplifts them, no matter what their circumstances are, that may bring them closer to Christ. When Gordon B. Hinckley first read the proclamation to members of the church, he said with so much sophistry that his past off as church as truth, with so much deception concerning standards and values, so much allurement and enticement to take on the slow stain of the world, we have felt to warn and forlorn. Sister Bonnie L. Oscarson said, when President Gordon B. Hinckley first read a family, a proclamation of the world, 20 years ago this year, we were grateful and valued the clarity, simplicity, and truth of this revelatory document. Little did we realize then how desperately we would need these basic declarations in today's world as the criteria by which we could judge each new wind of worldly dogma coming at us from the media, the internet, scholars, TV and films, and even legislatures. The proclamation on the family has become our benchmark for judging the philosophies of the world, and I testify that the principles set forth within the statement are as true today as they were when they were given to us by a prophet of God nearly 20 years ago. So some thoughts as you teach this in a classroom or in a home. Maybe a week before you teach, if it's in the classroom, ask your students... What phrase? What's most meaningful to you? What sentence? And then come prepared to share why it's meaningful and uh, how it's blessed their family. You know, and then you could just focus on what is most meaningful to them. You could maybe also focus on what doctrine in the family proclamation can fortify your family. Especially if you're doing this as a family. You, you read it and say, okay, what in there can help fortify us against the evils of our day? And what are we going to do because of it? How are we going to fortify our family today from what we learn in this week's reading? And just teach the doctrine. Teach it with love. Teach it with clarity. Teach it with sensitivity. And then I add, this last week, I was sent a couple books. Yeah, my books are done. They're in print. But I want to give a shout out to Cedar Fort. They did something to me that was very, very kind. In the front of a copy of, the, of a book that they sent, my editor, uh, people with Cedar Fort, took the time to write me a note. And I valued that. They didn't need to do that little personal touch. But I was very, very grateful they did. My shout out to Cedar Fort. They've been great to work with. And uh, I know that on Cedar Fort's uh, website, that book is available. And I just got an email today that said that they'd been shipped to Siegel Book. So that's awesome. Hey, thanks for spending a little bit of time with me today as we've talked about family proclamation. I hope that something in the family, or something that we talked today, will strengthen your family, fortify them against the evils of the world and maybe some things that have crept in. And maybe it's a time that we can use some of the things that you're talked about in the proclamation of the family 
that you can apply to your family to make it the best family and the best year you've ever had. Keep smiling. Bye.